there's three ways to grow a muscle. Myofibril hypertrophy. And what, what does we call that mean? Muscle but... protein synthesis. It means the growth of the actual structure of the cell. Actin and myosin coming together to make a thicker cell. And, you know, the actin and myosin, they're kind of like this, and they come together. So they're, they're, and there's no halfway. It's like, you know, you have, you know, the, the actin and myosin, they're either open or they're closed. And the shorter a muscle becomes, then the more of those things are engaged. So by creating more of those, that's myofibril hypertrophy. I think, and this is a, I hate calling it a problem with research because they probably have sports science people like really mad at me, uh, and they should be mad at me. Uh, so I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm saying this with caution. Volume training really doesn't do much of that. And when you say volume training, is that training to, to build your not, muscle? Not right. So like, so everything X3 was up until recently was focused on strength. So we were focused on that type of, of growth, myofibril hypertrophy, uh, the density of a cell, the performance of a cell. So if, you want, if you're a gymnast, you, you really want to focus on myofibril hypertrophy. You really don't want sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, and and be, because if you focus on myofibril, you have a high power to weight ratio. You are very powerful, not necessarily heavy. Um, no unnecessary weight. So uh, sprinters, gymnasts, that's what they are training for. <clears throat> now, most other, and also I should say, most types of resistance exercise are getting some of each of these things. So, um, you know, like, like for example, strength training, when you're really training for strength, going to failure or even beyond failure, like with X3, so you might have like negative two reps in reserve sort of thing uh, because you, you really worked the diminishing range, which remember, you've done diminishing range sets before. You're really just working the stretch position in diminishing range. Uh, or yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's like extra work for that stretch position. That may be part of the reason that we get so much blood flow into the muscle and start to build some of the other type of muscular growth, which is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So think of myofibril hypertrophy as the engine. Think of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy as the gas tank. So with sarcoplasmic, you want to get as much blood flowing into the muscle as possible so that the central nervous system decides, you know what, all that fuel we need for contraction, the ATP, the glycogen, and the creatine phosphate, we're going to store more of that here. And by storing more of it here, it makes the muscle bigger. So when somebody says their training is really focused on hypertrophy, basically all the stuff I ignored up until recently, um, that's what that is. So when somebody's doing, you know, five or six sets and they're, and they're doing like five reps in reserve. Like, so let's say they're using the X3 and they're doing a chest press where normally their all out failure set is 20 repetitions with the black band on the chest press. Well, instead, if they're trying to make the muscle larger, they might do that on, you know, the beginning of their workout. And then they do five more sets, but only do 15 repetitions. So five reps in reserve, right? So, <clears throat> And you stop short of failure so that you're really just compounding that blood flow in the cell, leaving that ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate behind. Really just glycogen and then, uh, you know, based on the, the GLUT4 function, it's, it splits off into these other uh, fuels that are ready at different stages. The glycogen is, well, ATP is the most ready, then glycogen, then creatine phosphate. So... <clears throat> The compounding of those fuels, so this is, this is volume training. The bodybuilders are really heavy into the sarcoplasmic effect. So when you, when you see guys who are clearly not training to fatigue and they're doing just set after set after set, that's what they're doing. And so like a lot of times I'd show, and I was totally ignorant to how bodybuilding worked or the approaches or anything like that. So I'd show these guys X3 and I'd go to absolute failure and they'd go, do you have to do it like that? Or, you know, can you just do it 
you know, until, until you just get a pump and then, and I'm looking at them like, why would you want to do that? Well, now I know because I've read, uh, hypertrophy research. Like I, I, like and when, I said, how long ago have you read that research just out of interest? The last it? six months. Oh, okay. Like I ignored it like my yeah, whole Because last life. time we kind of didn't talk about this and I think you've made an interesting distinction, um, particularly even though people are, are, are referencing some of your stuff because I, I guess, you know, I've, I've almost changed some of the questions I was going to ask because it sounds like it's dependent on, well, what are you training for? Are you training for pure strength? Are you training because you want to build muscle or, you, or do you kind of want a little bit of both? Yeah, and, and, guess and is sometimes, some... sometimes somebody will say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a rugby player. Uh, you know, well, are you a prop? Are you a lock? Or are you a wing? Because I'm going to have a different training. Like a wing needs to focus on strength only, like myofibril growth. The standard X3 program is for them. If you're a prop, yeah, you're better being bigger. So I mean, that's a, that's a heavy guy position. You still need to be able to move pretty quick. But being 160 pounds, you're not going to be a very good prop. Uh, so you want to volumize some of that tissue. Plus, it gives the muscle endurance. So like sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's not really strength training. And when you say volume training, what the hell does volume mean? Does it mean just the size of the muscle or does it mean you do a lot of it? Actually both. <laughs> uh, and neither of those two things necessarily matter because what the actual effect is, is you can go from contracting against a weight, 12 repetitions, then to 15 repetitions, then to 17 repetitions, and then you can change the weight and your repetitions get lower. But it's a different type of strength. It is an ability to sustain uh, consistent contractions. Like, like if you're a mixed martial artist, for example, you'd probably want that first type of strength as opposed to the second. That's right, you don't want to carry around any extra weight. You don't want your blood pumping to a larger muscle. You want your blood pumping to a smaller, more powerful muscle. So like MMA guys, they're not doing volume training at all. They're doing X3 as standard. And coincidentally, like uh, Forrest Griffin wrote the foreword of my book. Like the UFC guys really understood X3. They like, they like, wow, I can you know, deliver a lot more power in my, you know, in my fighting by using this. Whereas then the bodybuilders are just like confused. Like, you know, why do you only do one set? And why does it look like your head's gonna pop when you do that one set? And it's like, well, you know, cause I'm trying to stimulate the maximum amount of strength. And they're sort of like, wow, this guy really doesn't know bodybuilding. Yeah, you're right, I don't, uh, but I figured it out. <laughs> uh, and so um, you can use it sort of in two different ways. And when it comes, so now let me talk about the third type of yeah. muscle growth. And that's called hyperplasia. Now, that's the hardest kind to get. And it really has to do with a combination of stimulating the muscle, having a lot of blood flow, and then stretching after that. So... And why so, would you, just, just before you go on to that, why and who would, would be interested in that just to kind of help understand it, that? It would be an amplification of the first ability okay. being myofibril. So, uh, but it's, that splits muscle cells. So whenever they do a cadaver examination on somebody who is like a bodybuilder or a power lifter, and then they count the number of cells, and they're like, oh, this guy was clearly born to be you know, a strong guy because he has like five times the amount of muscle cells that the average person has. And for a long time, the idea was you only have hyperplasia in the womb. Like after you're born, that's just the number of cells you have, that's the number you're gonna die with. So it turns out that's not true because uh, you can force them to split. When do we know that? When, do we, when do we find out about that? Is it a recent thing or? Um, I, I think the, First, it was theorized about in the 80s, I think um, Professor Jose Antonio out of Florida State. Um, he's probably like the top protein researcher like on earth. Um, he did his PhD dissertation in the stretching of muscular, uh, stretch mediated hypertrophy is, is what it's called now. Um, so you can also 
have a muscle grow just by stretching it. No strength training at all. However, you got to stretch it for hours on end. And it is a nine out of 10 pain that you have to go through. So much harder to get a muscle to grow. So I kind of took all this information. I just sort of split the difference and thought, okay, what are people going to do? And coincidentally, there was, um, there was a program out there um, from, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, there was a guy named Dante who came out with a training program, and he, he calls it DC training or dog crap training. So he sort of made the name of his training program an insult to the training program to sort of get out in front of the trolls. So it was <laughs> like, which was actually kind of brilliant because you talk to just about any strength athlete or bodybuilder and they're like, oh, I totally read that. Uh, I remember like 15 years ago. Um, and so what he would advocate for was what I saw as the best way to leverage everything. So first you get blood flow into the muscle, you get a pump. So you're stretching the casing of the muscle. Also, this was also uh, called bag theory. So as in the bag of the muscle, the, the fascia of the muscle, that's one of the limitations to growth because it's very tight on the cells. If you can expand it slightly, it gives the muscle more room to grow. So, so how do you expand it? Uh, it's a combination of getting blood flow, the maximum amount of blood flow, so the biggest pump you can have, and then after you're done exercising the target muscle, then you stretch the hell out of it. Nine out of 10 pain, maybe hold it for a minute, maybe 30 seconds. I said 30 seconds in the book. Um, and so that's what I call the hyperplasia uh, protocol. And so that's just added growth on top of the other two types of growth, depending on how you're training. And that doesn't that that the main the bit that we talked about earlier, which is then stretching at the bottom of the muscle. Those those are two separate things because what you're saying then is when you're, let's say you're doing a chest press again, what you really want to be doing is you want to be stimulating the muscle through the whole range, particularly at the top where you're the strongest. Um, the 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 bottom. Well, you want to make sure you go full range. So I think initially these studies came out to keep people from thinking of doing strong range partials. So what they, what they don't want to do is every once in a while you see somebody oh, put okay, 2,000 just... pounds on the leg press and then okay. they unrack it and they bring it back an inch and then, yeah. you know, they do like really yeah, short kind of repetitions. Like, okay, yeah, right, yeah. right. So those aren't nearly as productive as going the full range. I mean, I don't think anybody was really surprised by that, but it's great to know that. So you got to go full range. But there's no real magic in the stretch portion other than by going for a range, you get the maximum amount of blood flow, which is going to put the maximum amount of pressure on the casing of the muscle. If you stretch then afterward, because stretching a muscle, like pressure internally, pushing externally from any direction is going to make more room. So by blood volume, you know, let's say a muscle's from here to here and the, mu the muscle's in between. So imagine it looks like a football because that's, so they, they kind of taper off at the ends, you know, where, where they insert the origin versus the insertion. Uh, you can have internal pressure with the blood flow. Then by pulling it apart, you're intensifying what's going on on the inside and making that pressure even greater. And does that not, that you're, you're, story about um your body protects itself by making sure it doesn't overstretch um is that only if the muscle recognizes there being load on there as opposed to it just kind of actually stretching out then do you think oh you're definitely shutting muscle cells off by doing that but the workout's over so okay. it doesn't matter you're doing it just to create pressure on the fascia okay so that you're making more basically just making more room for for growth to happen 